Welcome top news today. On June 9, 1963, Anel Ponder and Fannie Lou Hamer, two activists connected to the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, were arrested in Winona, Mississippi, as they returned from a training program in Charleston, South Carolina. By that time, Mississippi had arrested scores of civil rights workers in an effort to stall the movement, often sending them to Parkman Farm, a facility that originated as a plantation and was seamlessly turned into a prison in the early 20th century. Hamer's life was, in a way, an anthology of the various cruelties that the Magnolia State had on offer for its black residents she grew up sharecropping, in Ruleville, and had been sterilized without her knowledge, a violation so common that it was known as the Mississippi Appendectomy. In Winona, the police took her and Ponder to a jail, where they ordered male inmates to take turns beating the women. Hamer reportedly needed more than a month to recover from her injuries. Brutality was central to the system of racial hierarchy known as Jim Crow, and Mississippi managed to distinguish itself in the administration of it, which is part of the reason that the opening, this past weekend, of the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, in Jackson, is a milestone in the state's history. The transition from the Mississippi where the civil rights workers Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner were murdered, for trying to register black voters, to the state with the largest number of black elected officials in the country is a testament to the will of all those who risk death in the hope of creating a more humane world. But the circumstances under which that museum opened remind us, again, that progress is neither inevitable nor necessarily permanent. Donald Trump's planned visit to the museum prompted the Congressman Benny Thompson, who represents the only majority black district in Mississippi, and John Lewis, of Georgia, who is a former chairman of SNCC, to announce that they would boycott the opening. Sarah Huckabee Sanders criticized Lewis' decision and seemed to suggest that he lacked respect for the civil rights movement that he had helped lead. It was noted that Trump appeared at the museum, where he told an invitation-only audience that Martin Luther King Jr. had been a personal inspiration, just a day after attending a rally, in Florida, where he again endorsed a candidate for the U.S. Senate who thinks that Muslims should not be allowed to serve in Congress, and who recently told an African-American man that America had been, great, during slavery. Trump, who has caused racial offense on occasions too numerous to note here, would have been a problematic presence at the museum for his anti-Obama birtherism alone. Yet there he was in Jackson, saying, Today, we pay solemn tribute to our heroes of the past, and dedicate ourselves to building a future of freedom, equality, justice, peace. Since his emergence as a political figure, Trump has been the conductor of the orchestra of chaos that American politics has become. Early on, his supporters gravitated to the prospect of a leader who could transfer the principles of business to government, but they overlooked a crucial pitfall. Trump has governed like the president of a company that is hesitant to expand beyond its target demographic, for fear of diluting its brand. That his brand is known for a kind of truculent self-glorification has only complicated matters. Trump never seems more ill at ease or more defensive than when he is called on to represent an ideal that stands for something broader than the self, particularly when that ideal calls for sacrifice. Many of the targets of his disrespect, Senator John McCain, the parents of Army Captain Humayun Khan, the widow of Army Sergeant Le David Johnson, even officials of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, have intimately known the capacity of Americans to subordinate their own interests and safety to those of the larger community. In Trump's case, we, the people, has been replaced by, I, the person. The problem, then, is not only that, as Mayor Chakwe Antar Lumumba, of Jackson, said last week, Trump advocates policies that run counter to the objective of the civil rights movement. Is that the ethic of seeking commonality rather than division, of enduring insults rather than retaliating for them, of withstanding punishment in service of a civic ideal, in short, anything that might have sustained an Ponder, Fannie Lou Hamer, and the countless other heroes of the civil rights movement, is apparently alien to the President of the United States. Thus, the museum in Jackson serves a dual purpose, which was on display on Saturday, as Trump toured the building and John Lewis stayed away from it to remind the public of history and to serve as an object lesson of some of the same concerns in the present when one white supremacist murders churchgoers and others march through the streets of a southern city. History is a bullet whistling through the dark toward Medgar Evers, as he stood in the driveway of his home, in Jackson it is the ruined body of Emmett Till, pulled from the Tallahatchie River it is Vernon Dahmer, who led voter registration efforts in Hattiesburg and died after the Klan burned down his home, calling from his deathbed for the struggle to continue. This has been the cost of progress. Mississippi, the South, and the United States have all traveled a great distance since 1963. But, from a distance, a mile marker and a headstone can appear indistinguishable.